As we begin our message today, I wanted to start by reading a letter that we received just this last week in the mail, and it was addressed to the church family, so I'm pretty sure the sender won't mind me reading it, but it relates to what our message is about today. It says, Dear Church Family, Jack and Glenda Pinkley were raised in Myrtle Point and eventually brought to the Lord through the efforts of Pastor Dermon Love in the 1960s. Our family was, pa- was baptized by Pastor Love in May of 1964. My dad volunteered to work with the youth for the church and within a few years was convicted to go to Northwest Christian College to study for pastoral ministry. Upon completion of his studies, Myrtle Point Christian Church ordained my dad and blessed him to begin a ministry that spanned some 35 years. I witnessed the blessing bestowed by the church on my family. I would like to give a small portion of the wealth God bestowed upon them while they were alive to the church that was so critical in supporting my family's journey. Without the early emotional and financial support from the church family, it's safe to say that hundreds of souls might not have received the gospel due to my dad's ministry. MPFCC needs to be credited for heaven filling up with saved lives. My dad passed away on November 20th, 2023, at the age of 91. Mom passed away July 12th, 2024, at the age of 90. They lived a full life, completely trusting that God would provide their every need, and he did, and then so much more. They taught me by example that all is given to us by his grace, and knowing his love is all that we need as we make our journey through this world. In a small way, I am trying to follow these tenets and give back to the source of all wealth here on earth. My parents began their journey at MPFCC. My dad sowed the seeds of the gospel in response to God's calling, letting the Spirit do the growth of real, eternal life. And now, they're spending eternity with the Father and His Son. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Pray hard and long. Love mixed with faith be yours from God the Father and from the Master, Jesus Christ. I pray this gift will be used to forward His kingdom here on earth. Sincerely, Barry Pinkley. That was a really interesting letter to get. And, you know, we looked up. It was interesting because the pastor that's mentioned, Pastor Love, uh, what we have in our notes is that he actually passed away from a brain tumor right around that, that same year. Uh, and yet, in his life, he made that impact. And a family that came into this church having no idea what God had in store for them came here, and they were loved by people like you who welcomed them here. They had community, and they started to find a purpose in their life through serving and doing something as simple as, as being a part of a youth group. And through that, they went into ministry, and through that, uh, thousands of lives actually got changed. And that is the kind of thing that can happen here on any given Sunday morning when we come before God's throne with a sense of humility and when we submit our lives to Him and do our best to serve in the way that God calls us to. Isn't that incredible? That's pretty cool. And today, we are going to talk about that in the life of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, uh, we'll actually be talking, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 6. I want to encourage you guys, if you have your Bible, feel free to grab it and open it up to Isaiah chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the seat in front of you. And if you're using that Bible then you'll see uh, we're going to be on page 685. So feel free to thumb through to that. Uh, I'll say Isaiah was a prophet during the Old Testament era. Around the year 750 B.C. is when he starts creating his writings. And Isaiah has uh, one of the, the largest prophetic books in the Old Testament. He's one of the most iconic prophets in the Old Testament. And God really uses him as the first major prophet chronologically to go through and share a ton of details about what's going to happen in the world in the time of head. And so he'll talk in anticipation of Assyria invading uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and conquering them. He'll warn them about what's coming. He'll also uh, know about what's going to happen through Babylon eventually. After the Assyrian Empire is dominant, a few hundred years later, Babylon's going to come in, and they're going to have dominance, and they're going to come in, in the year 586, and they're going to destroy Judah. And, and so he sees that and anticipates that, and he lays out this roadmap. And, and even in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, 
uh, as well as places like Isaiah 7 and 9, he's going to actually spell out many details about Jesus Christ when he comes and give incredibly detailed accounts of what will happen in Jesus' life. And so here is a very interesting thing because we get an, a front row seat, a firsthand glimpse of what exactly happens in Isaiah's life that starts this journey of him becoming one of the most uh, interesting and one of the most significant prophets in the history of planet Earth. Here he is. He's going to write uh, dozens of chapters here, telling us all kinds of details of what's going to happen in the future long before those things ever happen. And today in Isaiah chapter 6, he'll tell us, this is how I began that journey, which I think will be relevant to us. Now, as usual, we're going to take our passage today and we're going to break it down into five different sections. We'll read each one, we'll stop, and we'll discuss it. And I hope that God will use that to bring it to life for you. Before we do that, I want to take a moment right now and ask you if you would to please join me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, for this chance to study your word. Lord, you have passed this down, this account, 2,700 years ago. And here it is now, perfectly moved to us with the same intent that it speak to our hearts as it spoke to the hearts of the people Israel of Israel back then. Lord, I pray that distractions of this week, whatever pressures might be on us, that they would fall aside in these moments and that you would speak to us. By the power of your Spirit, please convict us of the truth that you have for us and help us to see you more clearly. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name, Lord. Amen. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 6, we'll begin today with verses 1 through 3. Um, like I said, we won't have words on the screen today, so you definitely want your Bible if you have it. Um, let's go ahead and begin. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe, robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their eyes, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. Okay, so Isaiah here gives us a date mark. Uh, we know of King Uzziah inside and outside of the Bible, um, this historical figure that actually existed. And we know a very specific date, actually. He died in the year 740 B.C. So uh, in the year 740 um, is when Isaiah has this prophet, prophecy, has this vision where he, he ascends to heaven and sees God's throne room there. And I'll point out with King Uzziah, King Uzziah was actually an incredibly successful king in Israel. He led about in Israel one of the greatest times of economic revitalization that happened in the history of the nation. Uh, other portions of the nation of Israel have been captured by enemy countries. Uzziah actually led military forces to go and recapture them. Uzziah, throughout his life, was generally faithful to God and followed him up until a slip up at the end. Uh, and so he, he was devout in his faith in God and following of God. He ended up having many of the nations that used to come and raid and destroy Israel actually paying him money just so he wouldn't raid them, just so he wouldn't go and take them over. And so uh, he was getting paid uh, and all this money was flowing into the nation. So there was a great deal of success. And interestingly, it's actually upon his death in the year 740 that for the nation of Israel and for Judah both, we see he's, this guy's actually a king in the southern kingdom of Judah, but the economic successes in both. Uh, it's at this point in time that we actually see the road turning a little bit and uh, things start to go downhill. So it's an interesting point in history where uh, there's been this big boom time and yet things are about to become very different. And so Isaiah says, that's when I had this, visit, this vision. And he says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So imagine for a moment here, Isaiah has been teleported uh, through this divine vision up into heaven, into God's throne room. Now notice he says it's the temple, and there's a reason for that. The temple is actually made as a, like a prototypical um, version of God's throne room in heaven. So that the instructions the Israelites got were very specific for, for the temple on earth, and that's representative of what exists in heaven. So Isaiah is seeing this glorified version of the temple 
up in heaven, and in it he sees God the Father on a throne right in the middle of it. We would imagine in the Holy of Holies here, it might be bigger to scale in heaven, but he sees God the Father seated there. And not only is God there, but God's the train of his robe, his robe is so huge that it literally is filling up the entirety of the palace. The whole thing is consumed by that. And uh, here Isaiah is no doubt terrified, uh, as we'll see, looking at this. And it, verse 2 tells us another detail. So God is here right in the middle of his throne room. Isaiah is going to be in his front row seat. And as he looks, he sees seraphim. And these seraphim, these are, this is a common term used to refer to a particular type of angel. And these angels are known to be the angels who are in, in biblical visions and book of Revelation and here and in many places. They're the ones who are in closest proximity to God. And the word seraphim actually means a fire. It, it denotes that there's fire in the Hebrew. And so we don't know, is their body actually made of some sort of embodiment of fire? Do they have some sort of humanoid-esque body that has fire originating from it? Exactly how does that work? But we know flame is a part of, of how they're identified. It's the very essence of their name. And so he sees these flaming angels, and I'll say scholars have some, some agreements, Jewish traditions do too, about uh, how large these angels are, but normally people are saying they think probably something like 15 feet tall from the human perspective. So gigantic angels, and each of them have six sets of wings. And that's interesting too, because Isaiah tells us what they're doing with the wings. They have two wings that they're covering their face with, and two wings that they're covering their feet with, and two wings that they're actually flying with. So they only need two wings to even fly. Now, that act of covering their faces and covering their feet is an act of humility. It shows that even these fire-born angels right in the throne room of God in heaven feel that their faces are not worthy to be shown to God, that their feet are not, are not good enough to be revealed to God in God's presence. God's so holy that even His holy angels have hesitation about fully revealing themselves in front of Him because He is that big and that significant. And these angels are there, and we don't get an exact count, um, but uh, in, other, in other accounts like Revelation, we'll see there's actually multitudes of angels around God, armies of them essentially, but in this inner ring of them, at least, there's these seraphim. Uh, incidentally, the singular tense of that is seraph. Um, but there's this, these seraphim that are around God. And as they're there, they're singing this, this hymn about God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, is the first line of it. Now, I'll say in the Bible, when you hear that, it's a little bit like it is in English. When you repeat the word three times, uh, then you're adding emphasis to it. And so uh, if I said I like that very, very, very much, you get the point that I, I really like that. It's hard for me to state how much I like that. And so in this case, them restating three times, holy, 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 about God the Father, they're pointing out God is what defines holiness. There is nothing that is holy like the way that God is holy. And in fact, as John chapter 1 points out, everything that is holy actually extends outward from God Himself. He defines what holiness is. He defines what righteousness is and what right is, and, and, and everything else just revolves around Him. Now I'll say, as we read this, it says, is the Lord Almighty, at the end of that, and notice the word Lord there is all capitals. Now, some of you might be aware of this, but, it, but for those who aren't, just want to point out, when we see the word Lord, all uppercase like that, that's an indicator that in the Hebrew, they actually use what we call the tetragrammatron, that's four consonant letters that were used to represent the name of God. The name of God to the Jewish writers was so sacred that they wouldn't even write it down on ink. That was, that was on the verge of blasphemy for them. And so they would just take the consonants of God's name, of Yahweh, and they would just write those consonants in the Hebrew down and leave the vowels out, and that way you knew what was there. And similarly, in the English translations, they've kind of followed that sacredness of God's name by making that all capitals and the word Lord. So really, that what they're actually saying here is holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Almighty. And they continue by saying the earth is full of His glory. God's glory, His, His greatness, it reverberates out into the entirety of the universe, and it's here. It's here and now. And when Jesus returns, by the way, actually, the earth will be the throne room of God. God's, uh, God's throne room will be centered right there on earth, and in an even bigger way, the earth will be full of His glory. So, Isaiah's seen this vision. I mean, imagine yourself in his place. You're, you've been teleported here. You didn't choose this. 
and yet here you are seeing God himself in front of you. And incidentally, uh, in the Old Testament, it, it many times it's pointed out, if you see God, you're probably not going to live through it. And Isaiah is one of the few people we see in the Bible, and one of the few prophets that ever gets this glimpse of God's throne room. Daniel does as well in Daniel chapter 7, but there's, there's a few examples out there, uh, and yet Isaiah is one of them. So let's see how this continues with uh, verses 4 and 5. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Okay, so again, another detail here. The angels are singing these things, and we're told that just at the sound of the angels' voices, as they are saying this hymn about God, as they're singing this hymn about God, that the entirety of the building is shaking. All right, that heaven shakes just from the song about God, and God's so great that these angels are embarrassed to even show their face in front of him. That's how great God is. And so he sees this and sees, I'm just nothing compared to all of this. And he sees smoke begin to fill the temple, which I guess if you've got fiery beings, well, why not have smoke? You know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, and so uh, there's this as well. And Isaiah's response is one of great humility. He is in desperation here. He says, woe is me. Like, oh no, this is not good. Uh, and he says, I'm ruined. I'm going to be destroyed. Perhaps he's worried he'll be cosmically unraveled by God because certainly that's in God's powers. Here he is. Uh, he's a man of unclean lips. Is not, and Isaiah's not just talking about uh, his personal sanitary habits. He's talking about the sin in his life, the words that he's spoken. And by the way, those words that he's spoken in the course of his life, uh, they come from his heart. And so his sin in his life is there. And his sin, he knows, is separating him from God. And in his humility, he realizes, you know, a mortal like me, who's made the mistakes I've made, should never be standing directly in front of God like this. This is not a good idea. I don't deserve to be here. I'm unworthy to be here. Uh, and I might be unraveled for being here. Uh, and I want to point out, that's kind of interesting, because I would bet dollars to donuts that if Isaiah was sitting in our church this morning, he'd probably be a better person than any of us are. Does that seem fair enough? Isaiah, by human standards, is an incredible person. I mean, he's one of the most famous people in the entirety of the Bible, and I don't think God chose him for no reason. And yet, even Isaiah, however righteous he might seem compared to other people, he knows right off the bat, I have no business being here. This is not good. I'm just some broken human being. And he adds to that, and I live among people of unclean lips. So if it's not bad enough that I'm too broken and unacceptable, I'm surrounded on earth by people who are broken and unacceptable. And, and if my sin wasn't enough on its own, which it is, then the sin of everybody else around me would certainly make me unworthy to stand before God and to be in this position. Isaiah uh, is stricken with humility and with terror. He doesn't know what lies ahead. He doesn't know why he's here. And, and some of you may have read the passage before and have some idea of what's about to happen, but Isaiah really doesn't know that. Um, but he, he's shook by this. And notice at the end, he says, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord Almighty. Again, we see that solid uppercase Lord there. So Yahweh Almighty. We've seen, I've seen God himself, and that is a terrifying idea. All right. Okay, let's continue with verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Now your guilt is taken away, and your sins are atoned for. So while Isaiah is here kind of curled up in a ball, uh, very nervous about where he's at, one of these flaming angels comes over, and they come to the altar of sacrifice there in God's throne room, and they get a pair of tongs and pull a coal off that altar and place it in their hands. And we're told it's a live coal. That means it's a red hot coal. that This is uh, heated. And he goes and he walks up and takes it towards Isaiah, and he goes and he touches it to his lips. Now, let me ask, how would you respond? Like, okay, if the laws of physics are the same in heaven, I'm about to get a scorched scar on my face. That's not good. And also, there's the whole seraphim standing here thing. And I mean, if we're just honest about it, we're people of unclean mind, unclean hearts, unclean souls. And, and, and frankly, in Isaiah's case, you might be tempted to have some unclean britches here with everything that's going on. And so here is this, this angel coming to him. But the angel comes and takes 
that coal from the altar of sacrifice and touches it to his lips. Now, that is interesting because here we're seeing, it's almost anticipatory of Jesus. We're seeing here that the, the appropriate sacrifices have been made and those appropriate sacrifices can come. And the angel says, hey, your sins are forgiven after touching it to his lips. He says, you know what, you're right. You are that broken and everybody around you is that broken, but don't worry, God has something that can fix that. And the ultimate something that God will have before his throne that's going to fix that, of course, we know, and Isaiah himself will soon prophesy about, is Jesus Christ. There will be an ultimate sacrifice that can take away our sins if we stand before God's throne with humility and approach him in the right way. If we repent of our sins and fully turn our lives over to him, submit them to him, and are ready to serve God on the way he says, well, then our sins can then be forgiven. And so the angel comes touches Isaiah's lips, and in doing so, puts him in a position where he now feels like he is able to respond to God and not do it uh, with it being innately evil. Because, again, somebody like him does not deserve to be before something like that, and he is acutely aware of it. So his sins are atoned for, and now we'll see uh, the calling of Isaiah. Let's, let's continue on with verses 8 through 10. Then I heard the voice, of, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and, their, uh, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Okay, so Isaiah effectively gets an invitation here. And we see, again, verse 8, he says he hears God's voice now. We've heard the angels speak before, but now we're hearing God himself speak in heaven. And he asks this question, who shall I send and who will go for us? Now, something interesting happened there. The obvious question is, hey, who is there in this world that I could go send out and ask to be an advocate for the things I want advocated for? Who can I ask in this world to go serve and fill the roles I need service in? But interestingly, as God asks it, he asks it first in the singular tense, and then he asks it in the plural tense. And this is very reminiscent of Genesis chapter 3, where God says, let us make man in our image. God talks about himself using a plural pronoun to refer to himself. Here again, we see that. And again, this is a hint at the Trinity, that, that God is one, he's God, uh, he is God, and yet within him there is Father, Son, and Spirit. There's these three elements that are interacting with each other, that are all different expressions of him. And so uh, here he, he is, he's revealing that in the way he, that he asks his question. And he, he asks that, that question, you know, already it's a terrifying thing, but notice Isaiah's response without meeting a, was missing a beat. Here I am, Lord, send me. Let me ask you, does Isaiah even know what he just signed up for? Does he have any details about this? Because I have to say, like, when you hear it, it's like, wow, that's awesome, that's admirable. I'm so glad Isaiah's approaching things this way. But is that the way you and I would do it? Well, I'm not so sure about that, right? I mean, if I asked you to serve in some way, you'd probably come up with a lot of questions pretty quick. And, you know, like, well, wait a minute, where, where do I have to go? Who do I have to talk to? Who do I have to go there with? If it's people I don't like, I'm not sure I want to be there. And, and you know, what are the hours going to be involved? And, and what's going to be the investment on my behalf? And, and, you know, is it going to be physically exhausting or not? Do I really have to get my hands dirty if I go do it? You know, or, or can, I, can I just kind of stay back and supervise everybody else while they're doing it? And, and there's a lot of questions that come to mind when we talk about serving God. And yet, <clears throat> Isaiah here sees God asking, okay, who's going to go and serve me and represent me to my people? And that's all he has to hear. He says, I'm it. Put me in. I'm down. It's a pretty incredible thing. And so then God gives Isaiah a message, a message he's going to carry to his people. And it seems a little bit paradoxical as we read it. Um, but the message is God is pointing out the people of Israel, although the king of Israel has been largely living in obedience to God. The people of Israel have not. They've been combining the worship of God with the worship of pagan idols. They've been going and doing the pagan practices, 
of in being involved at the, the temples of worship in, in ritualized prostitution, where they, they literally will go every week and have sex with temple prostitutes, both heterosexual and homosexual. They'll take their children and they'll dedicate them to the service of those temples. So at age 12, their sons and daughters will be donated to be temple prostitutes at those temples. Uh, they're going and even sacrificing their, their firstborn children to these demons represented by pagan deities. And so while the king might be following God for the moment, God's people cannot have the same thing said of them. They're not doing the same thing. And so God is giving them a vivid warning here. It's almost as if in frustration, he's giving them this challenge. And so verse 9 here, he said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding. And this is what's going on already. They're hearing, they're there, they're often involved in worship of Yahweh, and yet, they aren't allocating that truth to their life. They hear it, but they're not applying it. Uh, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Again, they see the work of God around them. They see that God is there. And yet, they choose not to assimilate that information, not to have their hearts and lives changed because of that. He says, make the heart of this people calloused, make their eyes dull, and clo- uh, uh, make their ears dull and close their eyes. So, Again, he's saying this is what's going to happen. This is what is happening. These people uh, have hardened hearts. Uh, they become calloused. They aren't hearing my word when I bring it to them. And their ears are becoming dull. They're so slow to listen. Their eyes are closed. I find it interesting that eyes are referred to here because in Proverbs it says the eyes are the window to the soul. Have you guys ever met somebody who is deep in the thralls of sin? It just had an addiction that owned their life. You know, you can think of maybe somebody you've met on the streets before or a family member who's fallen into that. What happens to the eyes of that person? They start to dim, don't they? It's like the, the soul starts to bleed out of them or something like that. You can see in the clutches of sin how somebody, the way that they look and the way their eyes look is just completely different. And the people of Israel, their eyes are fading. They have become so mired in sin that they don't hear God's voice anymore. But they do go to church sometimes. They do pretend like they hear God. And so, you know, if I do evil all week, but then I'm actually at church on Sunday, I guess I'm okay, right? That's the way it works. And, you know, of course not. And yet, do we sometimes? Do we sometimes play that exact same game? Do we know the right thing to do and yet choose the opposite? And so God gives the consequences here at the end of that passage. He says, you know, we'll let them be that way because if they weren't that way, well then, and this is a a backhanded invitation to repent, it's almost like in his frustration he's saying, hey, you're not going to do it anyway, but wouldn't it be crazy if you did actually repent? Because then this weird thing would happen where I would forgive you and my wrath wouldn't be upon you and you wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of continuing in those actions. Instead, you'd be forgiven and put on right terms with me but you know, you could just keep plugging your ears and closing your eyes and hope I go away too. That's an option. And so it's almost as if uh, there's some, some frustration and sarcasm coming from God. And I'm sure there is that. You know, think for a moment. Uh, those of you who have had children, when your children are out there and they're doing the wrong thing, when they're doing foolish things, what does that do to your heart? You know, and initially you might go and talk to them and say, hey, man, please stop that. You're going to hurt yourself. Why are you doing that? But after you've said that 30 times, it starts to wear out, doesn't it? And then at some point you start to think, all right, well, maybe you should just go run and do it, you know? Go, go blow yourself up with this sin. Go see what it works like. Maybe then you'll finally realize the need to come back. Maybe, that's, maybe you have to be in the mire of this danger in order to actually realize how destructive it is. And it's not that God wishes for the destruction of his people. It's that God sees his people have gotten so hard-hearted for hundreds of years now, for generation after generation, that they just don't care what he has to say. And he's pointing out consequences will follow that. All right, let's read the final section here. Verses 11 through 13. Then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump 
in the land. Okay, so Isaiah gets this instruction from God. And Isaiah is going to have other instructions from God. He's going to have other words of truth to share with God's people. But his overarching message to the people in this time, and we see this consistently throughout his ministry, is stop sinning, turn to God, repent, approach his throne with the proper humility. You're showing up to church, but you're not living it out. Actually start doing that thing. Actually start living that way. And so Isaiah says, all right, Lord, you're telling me to say this. Do I go around and spend a week telling people or, or, or a month or how long exactly? And God says, oh, well, you'll know when you're done because by then everything will be destroyed. I am going to send in all kinds of misfortune on my people because they are in such a habit of ignoring me. And, and so he spells it out, until their cities, this is verse 11, until the cities are ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted, until the fields are ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away. This is talking about exile and other kingdoms. Um, and, uh, and though a tenth remains in the land, that's an interestingly very specific number, uh, the land will be utterly forsaken. And so we can catch up from this the implications of many things that are lying in. For the northern kingdom of Israel, their destruction is going to involve Assyria coming in and destroying them and laying waste to their cities. Certainly Babylon comes to mind. Babylon is going to come in and is going to conquer Israel as well and is going to actually take a tenth of their population back to Babylon with them, and, and that will be a remnant that will eventually have a new nation sprout up from it. And they'll be a very small amount, perhaps a tenth that's still there in Israel when this happens, and they'll think they're the lucky ones because they weren't drug off, but actually they're going to get thinned even more, which Isaiah is pointing out here. It's going to be even worse for them. They would have been lucky to have been taken in, as prisoners to Babylon because what happens in Israel is going to be much worse than that. And God says all this is going to continue until uh, there's nothing but a bunch of stumps where there once was a forest of my people Israel. But from that, a small number of them, as an oak or a terebinth tree can do, and you guys have probably seen this with trees before, sometimes you chop a tree off down into a stump and you think, good, it's dead now. And is it? No, no, I'll tell you along a ditch bank that I grew up in as a farmer, you, any tree out there, you had to tear out the roots and everything because they were, it was amazing. You know, I'd cut that tree down and the next year, it'd be a great big branch coming right out of the stump, headed off to do its work again. And it was so frustrating. Um, and, and so here's the idea that, that from that, some small remnant is going to come. And ultimately, as we'll see, the Messiah is going to come. That, that their, Israel is going, to, is going to coalesce together again after hundreds of years. We're really anticipating 750 years of trial, tribulation, and persecution for the people of Israel because their hearts will be against God largely throughout that time. There'll be some small percentage that are actually following God. And yet from that small percentage, God will bring the Messiah forward. Now, I want to point out, as we open today, we talked about a king by the name of Uzziah. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we hear about Uzziah's life. Now, Isaiah's prophetic career begins when Uzziah dies, and that's significant. He goes out of his way not to say in the year 740 BC, but to say in the year of King Uzziah. Why does he choose Uzziah? Uzziah has a son who's actually an okay king named Jotham. Why doesn't he say right before Jotham, right as Jotham took the throne? Well, I want to share with you, with Uzziah, where things went awry between Uzziah and the Lord, because I think it's something we skip over, but it actually is one of the things that defines this passage. King Uzziah, as I said, was incredibly successful. He was very well respected. He conquered land that hadn't been conquered before. The economy in Israel was booming in a way it hadn't in centuries. The people loved him. And yet, as he went on through his lengthy reign, towards the end of his reign, Uzziah became proud. He started to mistake the incredible things God used him to accomplish for his own accomplishments. He started to be filled with pride. And Uzziah one day came into the temple in Israel and tried to walk into the holy place of the temple. And he wanted to go in there and burn incense to God. Because who would God rather have put incense before him as an offering other than Uzziah? We wouldn't want those priests. Who are they? He would want him to do it. And according to Chronicles, there were 40 of the priests and of the, of the guards in the temple who actually stood in front of the holy place, the innermost part of the temple where God's presence was supposed to dwell, and they stood there and actually stopped him from coming in. And there was an altercation that's recounted there where they said, hey, look it, we know you're the king, we know you're in charge, but listen, you can't go in there. In fact, we can't go in there except under very special circumstances, so you certainly can't. And Uzziah basically responds and says, hey, I think you're mistaken, I'm the king, you're not get out of the way. And again, these leaders in the temple say, no, no, I, I, you are the king and you can murder every one of us if you want to, but you can't go in there. You absolutely can't. 
And Uzziah steps up again and basically says, get out of my way. I, I'll do what I want to do. And in that moment, leprosy, as it's described, spontaneously breaks out on his forehead. His skin begins to be ill. Leprosy is a common term used in Scripture for any multitude of skin ailments. We don't know exactly what the ailment was. But spontaneously, he gets some sort of skin ailment. His skin is cracking and bleeding and sickly and scabbed. And everybody is watching this. And now they say, now you definitely can't be in the temple because now you're, you're, you're ill. And in fact, by Jewish law, Uzziah had to be quarantined. And so Uzziah will finish out the last 10 years of his rule, co-ruling or a co-regent with his son Jotham. He will be in isolation because the Jewish law handed down to them by God had people who were sick like this quarantine themselves. The illness didn't spread. It was a clever thing God put there, almost like he understood how microbiology works, uh, being the creator of it. And so Uzziah spent the rest of his years in isolation. Now I point this out to say there's an interesting symmetry here. Uzziah is this incredible beloved king, well-respected by his people, doing God's work, loving God in a nation where very few people do. And nothing in the passage says Uzziah ends up going to hell for what he did, but there are consequences. And that things go awry when Uzziah comes before God's throne room and does it proudly and does it flippantly and tries to do it on his own terms. And in that moment, the entirety of his life changes. Everything becomes different from that way forward. And yet, moments later, Isaiah tells us about his experience walking before the throne of God. And how does Isaiah come before the throne of God? He does it huddled in a ball on the floor in humility, saying, I'm not worthy. I, I shouldn't even be seeing you. Uh, Lord, I'm not good enough. And yet, in that position, with a heart that's open, the minute God says, hey, who's willing to serve? Isaiah's right there. Yeah, for sure, send me in. It's almost as if Jotham thinks God's there to serve him. Excuse me, it's almost as, as if Uzziah thinks God's there for his service. But Isaiah gets it. I want to point out, this is, this is prototypical of what happened in these two men, but more than that, it's prototypical of what happens in you and I. You and I make decisions every day about how we approach the sacred things. Now, you may not have been taken in the vision before God's throne. I have it. You know, but you may not have had that experience. But every day in your life, you have God's calling to approach sacred duties He puts before you. And there's that question of how are you going to respond to that? What's your posture going to be before you stand God in that way? And I want to suggest to you, uh, we, we have a church here that has a great history of service, and we have people here who are incredible servants now. In fact, just last week, Ari came to me and said, we have to upgrade our software that we use to help, help track and, and uh, direct volunteers in our church because we've got so many volunteers, we outgrew it. That's a great thing. I like that problem. Let's do that again. Next benchmark's 150, by the way. We hit 50. Let's see if we can hit 150. Um, that's a great thing. And yet, I want to suggest to you, I think that very often in our lives, God calls us to serve, God calls us to be involved, and we are really good at being more like Uzziah than we are like Isaiah. Hey, God, I don't know if that works with my time frame. Actually, God, I, I have other things I was going to do over here, and that would probably get in the way of it. Or, oh man, that sounds like that could be hard. Like it might cost me something. I, don't, I, I just don't know if I'm down with that. You know, I, but I'm sure, God, you can, you're God, so you can obviously find somebody better than me. Go ahead. I mean, have at it. You know, maybe if I have time, I'll do my part for you. I want to challenge you guys today. I think we need to have a humble assessment of how we approach the sacred things in our life. And, and, and I mean that in our everyday life. How are you living as a parent, as a grandparent, as an employee, as a friend? How are you doing those things? But even more than that, here at the church, how are you doing that? This church is a vehicle that can move souls from a broken relationship with God and through the power of Jesus Christ can get them into right standing with God. And God called this church and this community to reach people here. And by God's grace, over the last several years, we've had success in that. We've grown steadily. But as we grow and we continue to find more people and lead them to Jesus, a strange thing happens. We need more volunteers to help with those processes. We need more people involved to help be a part of that. And, and that's not just something you could do, but that's a sacred duty that God puts in front of you. You might not feel like a superhero on our Superhero Sunday this morning, but look at Isaiah. By his own estimation, he was nothing spectacular. 
And yet when he humbly became before, came before God and the sacred things God put in front of him, God was able to use him in incredible ways and change things. We saw that letter at the beginning of the service. Somebody who never thought that they would be in ministry, who never thought they'd serve in that way. And they came into a place like this and met people like you who loved them and pointed them to Jesus and everything became different because of that. We have that sacred duty every Sunday. Now in your programs today, I want to point out to you, I hope you all have your programs in there. You guys are going to see an insert that looks like this. And this is not for you to turn in. You keep this, okay? So it's just between you and God. But I, I want to ask you all right now, if you would, grab a pen or pencil from the seat in front of you or, or your purse or whatever. Take a moment and look over this list and ask yourself, am I serving in any of these ways? And these are just examples. I'm trying to list out a bunch of examples of ways you might already be involved in church. Some of you are serving in a thousand ways, and I'm not sure you could put much more on your plate. And some of you haven't made that step yet. I want to encourage you. <coughs> One of the best ways to grow your relationship with God is in service to his people. And so look at that. Take a moment. We're going to give you a minute now. We're going to have some music playing as we do it. But oh, are we going to have music playing, Amy? Okay. Hey, hey, what do we know? We got music. We'll have some music playing. I want to give you guys just a few minutes to look that over before we close out in prayer. Please, please go ahead and fill it. I'll do the same up here. guys finish those up, I'm going to ask some of our leaders to come forward to lead us in our closing songs and uh, our closing time of communion and offering. As they do, I'll ask you to join me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to have the sobriety to see ourselves as you see us. Lord, it's, it's easy to get distracted by a thousand different things, TV and sports and work, and, and yet to miss the sacred things you put in the middle of our life. Please convict us and help us to see where you're at work in this. Please give us hearts for you and help our lives to be defined by a service that changes others through the power of your spirit, through humbly embracing the sacred things you put before us. Pray this in Jesus Christ's name, Lord. Amen.